Hi guys, I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. And we are here recording Lost in the Woods. We are on episode 21 today. You can hear the saw. We're going to have to deal with that. Yeah, so we do have a little bit of construction going on. I I feel like we say that a lot. (laughs) We bought kind of an older house that needed a lot of work. And so there's always something that needs to be done on it, I feel like. It's been an interesting week. My Friday morning started off very rocky, but I will spare you the details of that for now, and I will tell you about that at the end because... And by the way, she won't let me defend myself at all. And Madison is not going to be allowed to defend herself. Sorry, Madison. Uh, It's not going to happen. If I defend myself, though, it sounds a lot better. No, it doesn't. It sounds worse if you defend yourself. How? How? Because you can't defend your behavior in this situation. I I think I can. No, you can't. Yes. Your defense makes you look worse. I don't think so. 100% it does. Anyway, but Maddie did bring me a lotus. That makes everything a little better. So today we are taking you guys back to the Appalachian Trail. We visited the Appalachian Trail on one of our previous episodes and kind of a tiny bit on one of our other episodes and we'll talk about that a little bit later but there's another episode on the Appalachian Trail yeah and we might visit it again someday too so we'll see how that goes yeah so today we're telling the story of Molly LaRue and Jeffrey Hood yep so Jeffrey was 26 and he was friendly patient even tempered always calm and admired Gandhi which yep. is a great person to admire. Yeah, I feel like. for sure. Especially if you're a calm, even-tempered person. I feel like it just matches pretty well. Yeah. So he was also a rock climber, and he had even taught classes. And he had a teaching degree from the University of Tennessee. Yep. And then Molly was 25. She was sunny and energetic. She was described as an artist. And it's funny, she actually designed a 1984 postage stamp. Which was part of, like, a national contest that she had won. Really? I'll have to see if I can find that stamp. Be kind of interesting to see what it looks like. She had taken outward bound courses and spent a year providing wilderness therapy to kids. I think that was in Arizona or somewhere. She graduated magna cum laude in art from Ohio. So, yeah, basically it means that you graduated with great distinction. So usually really good grades, things like that. So they met in Salina, Kansas. They both worked for a church-sponsored program called Passport for Adventure, which is... This program is where they would take at youth risk into the woods and teach them how to set up camp and backcountry skills to try to set their lives in a more positive direction. So this would be like an alternative maybe to probation or juvie, things like that. Okay, so they both shared a love for the outdoors and a passion for helping children. Yeah, and shortly after working together, they became inseparable. So they both found out that they were getting laid in May of 19... Getting laid? Getting laid. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they were probably doing that too, but... Okay, so they found out that they were both getting laid off in May of 1990, and they thought it would be a perfect time for them to do a six-month hiking adventure. Yeah, which had been a dream for both of them, and they planned on hiking the Appalachian Trail. So, obviously, this hike is not for normal hikers, and they were very experienced hikers. Right. They were experienced in hiking, and they were also experienced in dealing with issues and solving problems. This was something that they were well equipped for. They had spent a lot of time in the wilderness, in the desert, in different climates. They would have been very good candidates for this hike. Yeah. So Molly cashed in her savings to fund the trip, and they decided to start in Maine. Starting in Maine is less popular, and that is because Georgia is warmer earlier in the year and the mountains in Maine tend to have a lot of snow and be colder so a lot of people start from the warmer end and work their way to the colder end so that it gets warmer by the time they get there 
but these guys are just jumping right into the cold side. Okay, so the Appalachian Trail is the longest hiking only footpath in the world. It goes from Maine to Georgia. It's 2,193 miles. It goes through 14 states, you guys, and it is 464,500 feet in elevation gain and loss. So about 3 million people will visit this trail every year. About only one in every four make it all the way through. Yeah, and I think that has a lot to do with this is not only physically challenging, but it's mentally challenging as well. If you think about how easy it is to injure yourself while hiking, when we've done our longer hikes, we're always terrified that one of us will get injured and it will cut our hike short. Because even a sprained ankle a missing toenail, a big blister. So many things can cause severe injury. So, and it takes about the average about five to seven months to complete the entire thing. Yeah. There are people who do it a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, you know, all that stuff. But. Yeah. Different skill levels, things like that. Not a lot of terrifying predators through this area. I mean, there might be the occasional black bear. There might be the occasional uh, bobcat. Black bears and bobcats don't really aren't really what I'm afraid of animal-wise when we go hiking. I'm more afraid of, like, cougars, not lions. Well, that's because we have had them eat people in our area, so... Yeah. (laughs) Same story. I've talked about it before, but never run. Never run. And never ditch your friends. And don't ditch your friends. Because then you get your face mulled off by a mountain lion. Pinnacle Lake or Vesper Peak, go listen to it. You can hear that story. It's kind of crazy. You might as well listen to the whole episode, too, and if you've already listened to it, then you know the story. (laughs) But... So on June 3, 1990, their trek began on Maine's Mount Katahdin, and this is where most people end, but they're starting there, remember. So they both kept journals, and they would remind each other that some days would be really rough, and they would wonder why they did this to themselves. Yep, I think that's pretty normal. Which is pretty normal. Anyway, yeah. So Molly soon wrote on June 6, well, we had one of those days. By the way, this is three days in. Yeah, so three days in, Molly's like, yeah, we're already having one of those. So I feel like the first few days are the hardest on a through hike. Yeah, I think it takes your body and especially your mind a hot second to realize that you're in this for the long haul and that you're just going to have to stop complaining about it because it does. The first day, you're really sore. The second day, it, you're you're sore a lot for the first few days. And I would say by day... Three or four is when we usually find our stride. So, I mean, it happens if you can't get into the groove, a lot of people end up quitting. And then Jeff also wrote, our bodies have had almost as much as they can take. By this time, they had encountered rain, insects, rashes, and sore muscles. So, they have not quite found their stride yet, but maybe by day four. Their shelter entries made it clear that they were enjoying their journey, and their journal entries became more upbeat. So on June 22nd, Molly wrote, We both felt good as we went to bed. Maybe we'll get this trail done after all. I like that. So Jeff's trail name was Clevis. Right, which is like a type of fastener? Yeah, it's like a it's like a fastener. It kind of is like a U-shape and then it has like a, a fastener that goes through it. Like you screw it in. They used it on boats a lot and things like that. I'm not sure why this was his trail name, but it was. So if you happen to know, let us know. And Molly's trail name was Nilgene. Is that how you say it? Nilgene? It's not Nalgene? Nalgene? I think it's Nalgene. That's the know. same thing I said. You said Nilgene. I said Nalgene. Do you want me to go back and check it? Nalgene. <laughs> Nilgene? Nalgene. <laughs> you said Nilgene. I said Nalgene. Okay. Um, which that, if you've hiked at all, you've probably seen it, is a type of water bottle. So my assumption is that she was carrying that type of water bottle on this hike. Yeah. Because, I don't know. I feel know. like I would have just spilled that on myself if I tried to walk and drink out of one of those water bottles. Yeah, it's kind of, they're kind of interesting trail names because they're kind of just objects. Like, a lot of trail names that I see are in More. regards to somebody's behavior. Um, you know, like, if somebody's a really messy hiker, they might get yard sale if their stuff is, like, all over the place as their trail name. You know, people get their trail names usually based on their behavior, so it's kind of interesting. Not Maybe they gave them to each other. I'm not really sure, but those were their trail names. Yeah. And we've talked about that before. A trail name is something that you can't give to yourself. Somebody else gives it to you. So, unless you're sovereign. That was our last Appalachian Trail episode, and the killer in that episode had given himself the name Sovereign Barf. So, has to be given by somebody else, but those were their trail names. 
Uh, she had left a poem in one of the lean-tos along the way that said, Last evening, I whispered, I think there are less bugs. And this morning, bring on the slugs. Through the roof of our tent, I see their familiar sludge, the stuff that resembles butterscotch fudge. Squish between my toes in my sandals. Yuck, this is something I just can't handle. So I hate slugs. <laughs> I hate yeah. slugs. I really do too. So, and this is something that travelers behind them became accustomed to was their writing in the logs. They tended to be really funny and thankful, thanking volunteers on the trails, thanking other hikers that they met. Uh, one named Muskrat was one that they mentioned. So a lot of hikers read their entries and hoped to run into them on this trail. Oh, and Molly also wrote, if you're behind us, you will pass us. Yeah, that's kind of how it is on through hikes is that you kind of just... You pick a pace and you kind of stick with that. Yeah, like the whole time. My mom has a faster hiking pace than me. By a lot. (laughs) By a good amount. (laughs) I'm a fast hiker in general. And when I have multi-days of hiking, I tend to notch up my pace a little bit because I like to get into camp. I like to have a lot of time to relax and um, pack. And so if you're wondering who's pushing who, it's my mom pushing me (laughs) and just, she just keeps hiking faster. Molly and Jeff definitely enjoyed their slower pace. So Madison probably would have fit in really well hiking with them. They stopped to take a lot of pictures. They studied plants. They, they enjoyed themselves. I don't do that. I just go a little bit slower than you. Two hikers that were named Greg Hammer, and his trail name was Animal, and Earl Swift, who we do not have his trail name. We do not know his trail name, but I will say that he is the reason that we have such good firsthand information on some of this, is that he wrote an article about his experience on this trail. He's a great writer, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the article at the end and stuff. It's through Outsider, but it's a really good article he writes beautifully about his experience on this particular through hike so i highly recommend reading it but he did not give his trail name in the article so the two decided that they actually wanted to catch up to molly and jeff yeah based on reading their log entries which i think is so cool and this does happen too so they finally caught them on july 20th at a shelter called Jeffers? Yep, Jeffers. Jeffers Brook Shelter, and this was in New Hampshire, and that night there were thunderstorms, which is always kind of cool when you're... We were hanging our clothes up to dry when a thunderstorm came in, Yeah, and it started raining as we were hanging up our clothes our on the very clothesline. very wet clothes that didn't dry that day. That's fine. Nope, I had them on my backpack the next day. Earl described Molly as blonde and dimply, quick to smile, solidly built but in good shape, spirited and funny. She had a blue-haired troll doll dangling from her backpack. Sounds like something Maddie would have. Yep. I had a Ken Barbie doll that I picked up in Italy on my backpack for our trip. Yeah, he was a barista Barbie. He was. He was very popular. Okay. And he described Jeff as bearded, beetle-browed, which I'm not sure what that means. He has thick eyebrows. That's what that means? Yeah. I would guess. Oh. That'd be my guess. I have no idea. My I... guess on beetle-browed would be that he has thick, dark eyebrows. Huh. All right. Uh, He also described him as thin and said he had a smoky, high-pitched Tennessee drawl. He carried one of the best packs around at that time, which was a Mammoth Green Gregory, which was a very expensive, nice backpack. It would have been noticeable and stood out. Yeah, because that is something that hikers do a lot. Gear check. Yep, we (laughs) notice people's gear and like when people have nice backpacks and stuff. So that would definitely be something that... Most hikers would have noticed. Taken note of, yeah. Yeah. So while conversing with the couple at the shelter, a bearded man in a baggy black suit and large brimmed hat showed up, and he demanded the east wall of the shelter where Greg had already set up. Greg wasn't really interested in moving and told the newcomer that he would have to settle for the middle of the shelter. There were two other hikers there uh, named Elizabeth and Chris who had been traveling with Jeff and Molly for a few days. The newcomer continued to interrupt conversation, asking about gear and if they liked it, that he heard it was bad gear. He was kind of an aggressive question asker, which we've seen this very rarely while hiking, where somebody doesn't really like settle into the vibe of a group or the easiness of conversation that people are having, where they tend to be more aggressive and they tend to ask strange questions, and this guy was definitely, sounds like he was one of those people. 
As everyone settled in for sleep, the guy's name was Ruben, by the way, Ruben pulled out six old Milwaukee tall boys from his pack and chugged them. Which, no thank you, because that is warm. That would not be good. I do not think that's a good idea at all. He then began to celebrate the Sabbath by chanting, wailing, and dancing in the middle of the shelter for hours. Yeah, which Greg interrupted him to suggest that he quiet down because hikers were trying to sleep, and he suggested that they were probably sleeping right through it, to which Molly yelled from the other side of the shelter that she was not, and others followed her in agreement. So when we go hiking, we are very cautious to not wake anybody up. Yeah, we always have our bags packed and ready to go. We always sneak out. We always do it quietly. Never turn the lights on. We never turn the lights on, which we've had other people do to us. In like the middle of the night. Yeah, so we try to be very respectful, especially if we're in a larger group of people. Um, we go to extreme lengths to make sure we're not going to wake them up because we do get, tend to get up really early to go hiking. So this would have been probably very frustrating for us. But Molly and Jeff seemed to handle it really well where they were calmer. They didn't really take to his baiting like some of the other hikers did. So obviously with their experience, they're able to handle... With difficult children, they can do Yeah, with this they can deal one. with people like Ruben. Molly and Jeff wrote in their journals that they had had poor sleep due to noise pollution. <laughs> I like that. I know. Luckily for all of the hikers involved, Ruben was a northbounder while they were southbounders. So they yeah. went their separate ways in the morning. Also, one of the cool things about this Ruben story is we would never know that without Earl's article. It's really great that we have so much firsthand information. So later that night, the couple settled in at Dartmouth Outing Club Bunkhouse. Kind of a mouthful. I would say for sure mouthful. So Jeff hitched into town to get beer for them and fellow hikers. They stayed up late talking about their layoffs, plans for grad school, and their lives. Yeah, the next morning they took a two-mile detour to a local restaurant for the hiker special, which was six pancakes, four pieces of sausage, coffee, and juice for $5 before heading back to the trail. I would say yes. Two miles? I would absolutely do that for two miles, although I'd never be able to eat that much food in one sitting. I would probably be sick, but that's a great deal. So they were last seen by Earl hitching a ride from a pickup truck. They smiled and waved at him, and that would be the last time that he saw them. So they continued to enjoy late starts, long lunch breaks, and their slow pace in general. By this time, Brian, or Biff, and his wife, along with Jean, flat feet, were trying to catch up with Jeff and Molly. Yeah, so they'd been reading about them in the journals, and so now there's three more people trying to catch up with Molly and Jeff. Yes. And Earl was trying to catch up with Greg, and Jeff and Molly were trying to catch up with Muskrat. Yep. <laughs> So basically just this giant train of people trying to catch up with each other. Yeah, which I think is really cool, and I've, I love that this happens. We did this a lot where you kind of ping pong back and forth, yeah. or you you know, you know, talk, you hear about people at hostels or at different places, and then you try to catch them. Uh, it's it's actually a lot of fun. We just tried to catch up with Gregory, and then met Abby, and God. Abby snuck you coffee at that one. Yeah. On September 5, 1990, and this is going to... We're we're trying to tell this in order, so it might seem a little out of place. It'll all make sense. So on September 5, 1990, a 38-year-old farmhand left home. Which is a shack full of garbage and beer cans. Basically. He bought a one-way Greyhound ticket to Winchester, Virginia. I don't like anything that involves the Greyhound bus. Or like a one-way ticket. Like where, why are you going there? We, We never find out. But he is short and stocky. He's considered smart and hardworking by his co-workers, although sometimes he had long, unexplained absences from work. Don't like that. He hitched for multiple days. He actually stopped in a library looking for hiking maps along the way, and he signed the registry Casey Horn. Which, by the way, this is not his real name. So, on September 6th, Jeff wrote in his journal, we reached the Allentown shelter for breakfast, There we met Paul, whom we talked to for quite a while. He's a 15-year-old who was kicked out of his house, or we talked about some different ideas for him to try. So, you guys, they are literally helping and counseling people on the trail. So, this kid, Paul, is like literally what they did for a living, what they are passionate about. I just love 
how great they... I mean, they just seem like really good people. So on September 11th, Molly and Greg... Molly and Greg, wow. Molly, the G know. really throws me off. I know. Well, and we had a Greg too, so... Yeah, yeah. it's really... It's really... Yeah. So Jeff spells his name like... G, G which to me O-F-F? which to me is the that's what I thought I always think that's how Jeffrey is spelled I only know Jeffrey's that are spelled with a J okay so Molly and Jeff broke camp at Peter's Mountain Shelter did I actually do that correctly the first time but yeah that was amazing but now I'm gonna have to edit you asking that <laughs> you can <laughs> okay so after breaking their camp or packing everything up they headed to the Doyle Hotel where they stayed. Uh, This hotel is known for its burgers and cheap beer. And a night there was $11. So, as you can imagine, not the nicest hotel. Yeah, it's kind of described as a very dilapidated, broke-down type place. But cheap burgers and beer. And it has a mattress. They haven't slept on a mattress for months. Yeah, literally. Yeah. But cheap beer. (laughs) <laughs> cheap beer, $11 a night, <laughs> sign me up. And you will be amazed what sounds good when you've been hiking. They had shrimp and mushrooms for dinner. They unpacked their gear. They called their parents. Jeff told his mother that she would need to bring soap and brushes when they met them at Harper's Ferry to celebrate their halfway marked. Which I did this with my mom when she did Wonderland. I met her halfway. But yeah, she came and she brought me snacks and she brought me new supplies and clean clothes. It was magical. But so they were planning on doing a similar thing where in a couple days they were going to be meeting their parents Mm -hmm. at their halfway mark. She also promised to bring two pumpkin pies. So he told his mom that they had something to tell him when they got together. Which there's a lot of speculation about this, but I'm, I'm siding with his sister who believes that they had gotten engaged. So they signed the registry at the hotel. A previous hiker had claimed to be the last of the 1990 Southbounders coming through there. And in response, Jeff wrote this. Hey, Greenhorn, you most certainly are not the last entry of the season. As you can't read this, we'll try to tell you when we catch you. As we hear, we're about mid-slip for the Southbounders moving down. Oops, getting food on the book. Good food, too. Time to go, Clevis and Nalgene. So basically, they're saying, we're just the halfway mark of all the hikers coming southbound, so you, there's a lot of people coming behind you still. Yeah. So the same day, an ATC t- caretaker was surveying some property. So they were working on rerouting a 16-mile paved section in Pennsylvania. Yeah, so paved sections are not super fun when you're hiking, you guys. It's a lot harder on the knees. And this particular section had no shade. Hot hot as hell walking on some Yeah, pavement. so they had been working to try to bring the shade or to try to bring the trail further into the forest and off of the road. And they were doing this by buying up property piecemeal and rerouting it. Mm-hmm. So she was out surveying some of this property at the time. So a bearded man was walking up the road. She thought that it must be a hitchhiker because there's no way that he was a hiker. He wore a flannel shirt, jeans, combat boots and he had a very small backpack he was also carrying two large red duffel bags so they had the marlboro logo on them so cigarettes yeah yeah for those of you that don't know i'm sure everybody knows what the marlboro brand is but hey so a couple red flags right he's wearing jeans which is not hiking attire always a red flag (laughs) flannel shirt could be a hiking attire that's fine but also you don't carry bags it's not it's not a productive way to hike you want the weight on your hips and your shoulders not on your arms like that that would not be productive so he kept his head down and did not talk to the surveyors um she would later say that something unnerved her about this man yep and then when she saw him later she deduced that he must actually be a hiker because he was heading in the direction of the Darrington shelter and she remembered thinking That if he hustled, he would make it there before dark. Because he still had a little ways to go. But she was surprised that he appeared to be heading in the direction of a shelter. Well, yeah, because he does not look like a hiker. Yeah. What she didn't know is that he was carrying a long barrel twenty-two caliber revolver and a box of 50 bullets, along with a double-edged knife that was 9 inches long. I don't like that. 50 bullets? Do you really need 50 bullets? You do not need 50 bullets. Also, a 9-inch knife. That is a little... Dramatic, if you ask me. Yeah. 
How big is the big knife that I sometimes carry? How big I don't is, know. How big it's not nine knife? inches. I would call that blade probably like four or five inches, and that's, I kind of feel like that's a lot sometimes, especially if you get arrested in the airport with it. I wasn't arrested. <clears throat> Sorry, detained. detained. My bad. So on September 12, 1990, so the next day, Molly and Jeff met up with some of Molly's family. They went to lunch at a truck stop. They also picked up their mail. They stopped at a small grocery store, and at 3.45 p.m., they headed up the trail toward Cove Mountain, and sometime that evening, they arrived at Thelma Mark's shelter. So the shelter was a three-sided lean-to. And it was a little ways off of the trail, so it's not just right on the side of the trail. You kind of had to hike down to it a little bit, but it's a little bit off, so it's not, you don't just run right into it, right? So this particular stretch of the AT is near Cove Mountain, which is in the George Washington and Jefferson National Forest, and we're in southwestern Virginia at this point. So on September 13th, a lone hiker would leave Selma Mark shelter and would hike north into Duquesne. This was the man that was seen days before walking along the paved path. By the surveyor. Yeah, Yeah, by the surveyor. He was no longer carrying the red gym bags. Instead, he had a big... Green Gregory backpack on. I don't like that. So the three southbounders that had been chasing Molly and Jeff were hot on their tracks. Flat Feet actually hiked up Cove Mountain towards Thelma Mark's shelter that day. He decided not to stop in, though, and trudged on to the Darlington shelter where he stopped. It was littered with trash and had an empty red gym bag in it, a bus ticket, and a library note written to Casey Horn. The other two hikers that had been trailing Molly and Jeff stopped to retrieve their mail. This would be Cindy and Brian, or Biff, Bowen, which people called them the Lone Moccasins. That was their trail name. They also had pizza, ice cream, and beer, and it was 5 p.m. when they started the climb to Thelma Mark Shelter. So they kind of did the same thing that Molly and Jeff did. They hung out in town, they got their mail, they ate, and then they headed up to this shelter, Mm -hmm. which was about an hour-long hike. So it was Biff's birthday coming up. And they planned to celebrate at Thelma Marks, and they were hoping to run into Molly and Jeff there. Yeah, they thought it would be fun to celebrate with them. When they got to the shelter, it was very quiet. Biff actually positioned his hiking poles to use as a weapon. Yeah, and you kind of... We've run into this before. If you are walking or hiking or something, sometimes you can sense a change in the environment. Like, the birds get quiet. The, everything seems to get really quiet for a second. Which is not normal. It's really kind of unnerving. And mm-hmm. you get a good sense for when something's not quite right. And sometimes we've gotten that feeling and never seen anything. But we always wonder, was there a bear nearby? Was something lurking in the woods? Like, could there have been something that we were sensing? But in this case, unfortunately, that would not be the case. When Biff saw that there was gear and equipment in disarray in the shelter, he actually told his wife to stay back and not come into the shelter. Mm. And he was shocked to discover the bodies of Jeff and Molly. Yeah, and within an hour, they were back in town calling the police. Yeah, so (sighs) it took struggling police three hours to reach the shelter. So Jeff was lying on his back in the corner with his head propped up on a makeshift pillow. And Molly was face down in a pool of blood. Jeff had been shot three times, and Molly had her hands tied behind her back and a rope tied around her neck. She had been raped and stabbed eight times in the neck, throat, and back. It was believed that they had died between 5 and 7 in the morning, and they were actually attacked in their sleeping bags. I, I literally cannot imagine this. I mean, you're in your sleeping bag, you're sleeping... And a lot of times you sleep very soundly when Mm -hmm. you're hiking. And to have something like this occur just seems... uh, Terrible. I I just can't. So the man who in the beginning had the red duffel bags, the red gym bags, in the following days had appeared to not only steal their gear, but also their story. He had claimed that he had started hiking in Maine around the 1st of June, and was trying to catch up with muskrat. Seriously, you guys. This this tells me that they probably conversed with their killer. Like, did they agitate him somehow? I doubt it. They don't seem like the type. Had he come in the middle of the night? 
had he read their trail entries in order to know this information? Because had he taken their journals. That's my theory. Did he read their journals? Because not only did he take their stuff, but remember they had their journals. He could have easily gotten all the information that he needed from those journals. So that's what I think happened. I think that he read their journals. Those two scenarios are most likely to me that he either chatted with them before they turned in, was at that shelter that night, or that he read their journals. Either way, I don't like it. So most likely they reached the shelter first and at some point their killer arrived. So police worked well into the night trying to get vehicles to the shelters. Like, this is not a vehicle accessible area. Like, they had to cut down trees, and it took hours to get vehicles up there. Yeah. So, on September 14th, Jeff's mom saw on the news that two hikers had been murdered near Duquesne. Which, you guys, that is where Jeff had called her from a few days before. She called Molly's dad to tell him what she had heard, and he burst into tears, sure, that it was their children. That just makes me so, I can't, I'm struggling. That makes me so upset because you hear something like that and to have that feeling like you know it's your kid. Yeah. I can't even imagine. So police learned from the surveyor about the man who had been walking with the red bags. One was still in the shelter where Jeff and Molly were killed. The other one was found in the Darlington shelter and they also had the note found with the bag, which was from the library yeah. that had the fake name on it. Word spread very quickly, like it usually does. And Amongst hikers. Yeah. Yeah, so along this trail, which this happens a lot. We went, When I hiked Wonderland, I think it was on day six, we ran into people going the opposite direction as us, and they were like, oh my gosh, did you guys hear about that big group that started and only two people continued past day four? And we were like, yeah, that was us. But that's how it works when you've got people going in different directions or you've got people filling out blog books and things like that is word spreads really fast. So on September 21st, only eight days after the murder, two hikers recognized Jeff's backpack and sounded the alarm. Yeah, and it sounds like these two hikers, or at least one of them, had taken it upon themselves to go search for this killer. Mm -hmm. They were looking for Molly and Jeff's gear or looking for the description of this guy. So he was picked up while attempting to cross the Harper Ferry around 8 p.m. that night. Uh, And remember, Harper's Ferry is where Jeff and Molly were supposed to meet Jeff's parents. So he said his name was David Casey Horn. It was not. His name and age set FBI on alert. Yeah, so the name and age resembled a fugitive wanted for murder, and his name was Paul David Cruz. But their fugitive's biological dad had the last name of Horn, So they were like, that sounds kind of similar. And this man also had the tattoo of Casey on his right shoulder. And so did the man that was arrested. So after taking fingerprints, they learned that it was indeed Paul David Cruz. Which this man just is not the smartest. Like, really just is not. Like, not only does his made-up name... Still get him caught. Still get him caught. He would say little about the incident. He was arrested wearing Jeff's backpack, his boots... His watch, also carrying both of the murder weapons. You guys, seriously. And he had been on Florida's most wanted list since 1986. He was the suspect of a murder on July 3, 1986, so four years earlier. And this was for Clemmy Arnold, who was 56. She had offered him a ride home. So this was in Bartow, Florida. She was later found naked and nearly decapitated. She was found in a swampy area near Cruz's home. He had been found to be driving her bloody Oldsmobile. He took off, which I read somewhere that his brother helped him escape. And I'm sorry, but you should probably be held responsible a little bit for the murders of Jeff and Molly. Because if you hadn't done that, maybe they would have never been murdered. I'm just saying. That really bothers me. So he took off, and police recovered the car along with a knife and bloody clothes, but no sign of Paul. So he'd basically been on the run since then. For like four years. Yep. And they also didn't believe that this was his first kill. So a little bit about Paul David Cruz. So he was 36. He was abandoned as a child. He was adopted at the age of eight, but ran away on a regular basis. 
So already off the bat, childhood trauma. So he joined the Marines in 1972. So then he got married in 1973. He became a father. None of this helped his demons, obviously. So he attempted suicide. He went AWOL. He was discharged from the military for severe mental depression. His wife divorced him in 1974 and never saw him again. Probably for the best. Good call. Yep. Then he, he bounced around. And then in 1977, he turned up again. He got married again. Really great. Really well, great. How does he keep getting people to marry him? I don't know. I don't know. I can't even get someone to date me. How is this man married twice? I know. One morning, he'd crawled into bed with his wife and got behind her and held a bayonet to her throat. Why does he have a bayonet? I don't know. But shockingly, they got divorced. <laughs> So the trial for Molly and Jeff started on May 15, 1991. The evidence was obviously damning. There were 60 witnesses, 158 pieces of evidence. He had been arrested with the couple's belongings. He had the murder weapons. He left his belongings behind and DNA linked him to the rape of Molly. In other words, there's no way any jury is going to look at this and be like, no, you know, I think he's innocent. Yeah, and it doesn't even sound like he really tried to defend himself. He was very uncooperative. Sounds like he didn't say anything at all. His attorney said that he believed, which believed. So I don't know if he heard this from his client or this was the impression he got from his client, but it's never said that Paul said this exactly. But his attorney said that he believed the couple made it to the shelter first and that he came upon the scene and something happened. He said this was a brain on cocaine and Jim Bean. He would drink a quart of Jim Bean and a cigarette pack of cocaine, and that's how he would hike, which I don't... I'm guessing he just carried the cocaine in a cigarette pack, because if you actually took an entire cigarette, <laughs> cigarette pack full of cocaine... Like, imagine a pile of coke as big as a cigarette pack. I mean, pack. that would probably make your hike go really easy. Like, you'd be, like, booking up that mountain, but... You'd be tweaking off the walls. Exactly. So, I, I feel like you'd be dead if you took that much cocaine. But either way, he's saying that his client was taking alcohol and on cocaine at the time. And you mix that with his possible mental issues. Which we're pretty sure he's got something. His attorney did say that he was not interested in talking about the murders or any other crimes that he had committed. Which is ridiculous. Makes me want to punch him in the face. I really do. It it makes me an extra kind of mad when a criminal does not take responsibility for what they did and at least tell authorities or the family what actually <sighs> happened. Because it leaves the family and everybody with these unanswered questions. And I just feel like you should be put in solitary confinement until you give it up. He was convicted and sentenced to death by lethal injection. But in 2006, this was converted to life in prison. Molly's mom hiked to the shelter on the first Mother's Day after her daughter was murdered. She thought it would be a dark, sinister place but it wasn't. She said Jeff and Molly were murdered in God's cathedral, and if someone were murdered in God's cathedral, then murder could be committed in any place. And she's talking, I think, about the nature and how beautiful it is. That That's her reference to God's cathedral, I yeah. believe. So the shelter was torn down in 2000, and a new one was built in its place, and this one was named the Cove Mountain Shelter. Thelma Mark Shelter no, no longer more. exists. Yeah. In July 2006, Molly's mother lay dying in hospice of cancer. She had a dream near the end and said that she had seen Molly waiting for her. Jeff's mother was actually holding her hand just before she died. And that just breaks my heart that this family, you know, they had this bond and they came together and it's yeah. just so awful. Okay, you guys, so Maddie's crying right now. The mom's holding hands gets me every time. It's really, it's sad. Actually, I'm, I'm struggling not to cry now just seeing Maddie cry. But it is, it's so sad. They both had this tragic thing happen and they're coming together and... They just wanted to help. I use, they just wanted to help sick kids. They just wanted to help kids. I know. And they went on a hike and they were killed. Maddie, by the way, is not a crier. So it's actually really rare to see her crying. I'm not a crier either. Neither of us are criers, but yeah. when we do cry, it's it's ugly crying, which I is just, which is what Maddie's doing right now. <laughs> I just can't. I just it's so sad. I know. And it like really they is. weren't even like it wasn't Jeff and Molly weren't even like married or anything. Like they were just dating, and they their families their, stayed yeah. through 
together through the end of this, like through all of it. I know. That's so sad. I, I really do think that's pretty amazing. So I'm going to continue reading. Maddie needs a second, so we're just going to give her a second. This this part's sad too, though. So at the hearing in 2006, Molly's dad, which obviously, I'll just say it now, he's a bigger person than I am because I would not be able to do this. But he said, Paul, I'm here today to offer you forgiveness for what you have done. So at this point, Paul is making eye contact with him, which can't handle that. So he said, I wish that you can now find peace. Molly had decided to devote her life to working with troubled children like you certainly were. Paul, I think it would be great for you to pick up where Molly left off, starting with yourself. Help the Mollies of the world learn who you are and try to enlist the help of other inmates to help in this effort. You are a gold mine of critical information that needs to be unearthed. Peace be with you, brother. Peace be with you. Which, good for him, forgiving and being able to to even say those words because I'm not sure that I could. But also, I think it's a great point, right? Like, the more information that people like Jeff and Molly could gather about criminals... To help stop this in their youth before it exactly before it becomes like so, I think that that's an amazing point, and and I think if more criminals did that, we would have a much better understanding of yeah these crimes. So there have been multiple attacks on the Appalachian Trail, usually near roads, easy accessible trails, towns, buses, train stations, things like that. So we're going to go through some of the crimes that have occurred on the Appalachian Trail or really near to the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. So in 1974, Joe Pilsen, who was 26, was killed at a shelter in Georgia, and Ralph Fox was arrested for the crime. And in 1975, Janice Balza was killed with a hatchet don't like hatchets, same as hammers. Oh my gosh. I feel like they're in the same category. Hatchets and hammers, you guys, I can't. Paul Bigley was arrested and he had allegedly killed her because he wanted her backpack. Seriously. Which I think is ridiculous. She probably would have given it to you, buddy. Like, just, no. So, in 1981, Robert Mountford and Laura Ramsey were killed by Randall Lee Smith. And in 1988, Rebecca White and Claudia Brenner were shot by Stephen Carr. Claudia survived, but Rebecca was killed. He had claimed that he had been enraged by the couple having sex in the woods. So he murdered them. Seriously, I can't. That pisses me off. So in 1990, we have Molly and Jeff, right? In 1996, we have Julia Williams and Lolly Winnens. They had their throats cut. And Daryl Rice was indicted for their murders six years later. Yep. And then we have 2001, Lois Chaput, who was stabbed to death. Her murder is still unsolved. And we did that case. Yes. And that was episode 12, Murder on Mount Isolation, which is a crazy story. That's our Canadian hiker that Mm -hmm. was murdered. So go and check that one out if you haven't heard it yet. It's a crazy one. So then in 2008, Randall Lee Smith shot two fishermen who survived, and then he was charged with the 1981 murder of Robert and Laura. Yep. In 2011, Scott Lilly died on the trail, and his cause of death was asphyxia by suffocation. And his murder is still unsolved. So a couple of things that Maddie and I have talked about recently because of this case is different ways to be safe while out hiking or even just while out anywhere, really. But I feel like my friends think I'm just a crazy, cautious person that's afraid of paranoid life. People just think we're paranoid, but we are we are pretty uh, paranoid. I'm going to be the last one to get kidnapped, let me tell you that. <laughs> well, there you go. So, looking for people out of place. People, jeans. People wearing jeans out on the trail. Or if you're... In a different environment and somebody is not dressed for that environment, have that be a concern or or at least take note of it. Take note of it. Right. So wrong gear, no gear, wrong shoes. Also, angry or demanding hikers is not normal. Mm -hmm. Most hikers are pretty chill. They're pretty relaxed. If you encounter somebody who is hostile, that's a concern. Check in often with your family, with your friends, make sure someone 
knows where you're going. Oh, I yeah, cannot, tell someone where you are. I cannot stress how important this is. There are so many times and hikers. There are hikers that we have rescued who did not tell a soul where they were going. And they would have probably died on that mountain if we hadn't yeah, like found the guy them. that marched up freaking Pilchuck in his jeans with no food supply or water in, in the snow. snow. So tell somebody where you're going. Be smart about it. Even if you're an adult, Find somebody, somebody. Yeah, and tell somebody that's going to know what to do with that information, right? Like, I tell Maddie this all the time. Don't tell your friends where you're going. Tell an adult. Tell somebody that's going to get that information and be able to alert search and rescue, right? Like, (laughs) if Maddie's telling her friend, I'm going to go do this hike, and if I don't come back on this day, do something about it. But tell somebody where you're going. Another thing, make sure somebody has your password, Right, not just to your phone, but to your Google account so that it can be gotten into, right? So if you think about the first episode we did, which was the Panama. The Panama, the girls. Continental Divide. The girl couldn't get into her friend's phone and her phone had died. And the theory is is that she was incapacitated or dead at this time. And the friend couldn't get into her phone to try to contact authorities. She tried the password multiple times and couldn't get into the phone. So it, who knows what would have happened if she was able to get into that phone to call for help, but she wasn't because she didn't know the password. And then if you look at the Theo Hayes case, they started searching in the wrong direction and didn't know that they were searching in the wrong direction until they hacked into his Google account because Google would not give them this information. And they could actually see where he had gone that night. And they could even see that at one point he'd been running through the bush. So make sure that somebody has your information. And I tell Maddie this all the time. Put it in a sealed envelope. Put it in a safe place so that I have access to it or so that somebody that you trust has access to it and will know how to use that information because you just never know. If Maddie went missing, I would want to be able to see where she was, where she went, where's her phone now, without having to go through the red tape of trying to and maybe never even getting that information. So give somebody your password. We're, I said be aware one hitchhiking, but just don't hitchhike. Don't follow our lead. Just don't, don't Yeah, hitchhike. just don't do it. It's a bad idea. And then follow your gut. Don't be afraid to be rude. If you remember the Meredith Emerson case, which was Blood Mountain, she was seen walking with her killer. And I would guess that it's because she didn't want to be rude. He was probably trying to strike up a conversation with her and she didn't want to be rude. If you get a bad feeling about somebody, do not be afraid to offend them. And then also make eye contact with people because if you make eye contact with people, that tells them that you saw them. And they might be less likely to try something if they know that you saw them. And then be aware of your surroundings, like the eyewitness game that we play, Mm -hmm. where we pass a group of people or we pass a person and somebody says eyewitness and everybody has to try to describe what that person was wearing, what they looked like. So, I mean, it's just a fun way to be aware of your surroundings. Also, carry a GPS if you can. We always carry GPS when we are hiking it's an additional cost. I think it costs us like $11 a month or something like that to have our, our satellite phone. But we can call for help with that. We can message people with that. We can send our coordinates and our location with every message that we send. So it's just an extra peace of mind for us. Mm-hmm. And then we also have it if something, if we come across an injured hiker or somebody that needs help. Uh, there was a guy that was rescued last week off of a mountaintop and he had activated his GPS beacon And they didn't know why, but it was alerted. And so they went out searching for him and they were actually able to find him. He was in an area that he couldn't get down from. And he probably would have died if he didn't have GPS on him that day. So if you can carry GPS, maybe even like go in on it with some friends or some people where you take turns carrying it, you share the cost of it. Carry emergency supplies in case you get lost or lose your way. We always carry emergency food and emergency blankets, things like that. I usually carry my tent just because it's really light. My zero degree blanket is my favorite thing I think I carry in my pack. Yeah, and rarely, you guys, do we ever use these items. But if something happened, we would have them. I use my blanket all the time because yeah. I'm always cold. Well, it's usually I'm... cold at the top where we go. Well, yeah, there. and then I'll set up my hammock for like the kids and stuff. Like We'll always sit in our hammock yeah. if we can at the top when we eat lunch and... 
always bring out the blanket. Always, yeah. Um, also, carry something to protect yourself. And this can be your trekking poles. Trekking poles, knife, weapon. bear spray. Bear spray. I mean, not what? necessarily for bears either. I know, I feel like you don't need to spray a bear with bear spray. Yeah, rarely are you going to need to spray a bear. But, like, but you could spray a human with that. My favorite instance of why I think that you shouldn't spray bears with bear spray is because it was this lady. She had, like, her kayak out on the beach. And oh, she, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite. It's so funny. So then this bear comes up to her cabin and is, like, coming up and, you know, just checking things out. And she sprays the bear with bear spray through, through the screen door, yeah. you guys. The bear is not The bear is her. not coming in. Like, the bear is not doing anything. Shut it's, your door. Yeah. It's just sniffing around. <laughs> and then, after she sprays the bear with the bear spray, the bear goes down to the beach and starts destroying her kayak. And she's like, no, bear, why? No, bear, no, no, bear. And we're like, and like, you deserve that. That's what you get for spraying it in the face with bear spray. Yeah, so I mean, there are ways to protect yourself. I always, if we have an incident happen and I hand a trekking pole or throw a trekking pole at one of my children, they know why I'm doing it. You know, think about that. Have scenarios with your kids. If you hike with your kids or with your friends, like what, hey, what do we do if a bear comes across our path right now, you guys? Like, hey, what do we do? What, hey, what do we do if somebody comes up behind us? You know, there are, you can plan and prepare for these things to make you and your family and your friends just a little safer out there. Because like we said, it's very rare that anybody is actually percentage wise like hurt in the woods Mm -hmm. but why not protect yourself if you can so the article that i was telling you about you guys is from outside and it was an article written by earl swift and he not only is a journalist but he was the one that was hiking Mm -hmm. the appalachian trail at the same time as jeff and molly and i really do think that he did an amazing job capturing the experience of the trail and of hiking. And I want to read you this message that he sent me. I live in the Virginia Blue Ridge, a mile from the AT. And for years, I've banged out a five-mile hike almost every morning. I've never felt unsafe, aside from a few moments around close encounters with rattlesnakes. When you consider how many millions of people step onto the trail every year, it ranks among the safest places of real estate in America. That's vital context. A through hike appeals to our romantic desire for escape and a primal brand of self-reliance and for the overwhelming share of its travelers, including those who don't finish. That's what it delivers. It changed my life and has paid dividends every day since. I just wish that I could write like him. But an amazing point, I mean, he really hits it on the head with how important it is and how safe it really is to be out hiking. And the fact that he encountered this traumatizing experience and still gets out there every day and still finds it a vital piece of his existence. Yeah. So... I mean, if you have a second, go read the article because, you guys, it it gives a lot more information about the trail itself and about the hike and things like that. So I think he did a really good job on it. Yeah, we also, uh, there was the article from thebackpacker.com. People's done an article. Uh, Medium did an article. So there's a ton of information out there that you can go and find if you want more information. Yeah, that is the story of Molly and Jeff. That one kind of hit us a little harder. Um, And they seem like such good, genuine people. And we'll post a picture of them, but like when you look at them, they just literally don't look like they could do any harm to anybody. They look like somebody we would be friends with on the trail. And our heart goes out to everybody involved, the family, the people who hiked with them. I am sure that this is something that you live with on a daily basis, and we we feel for you. We can't imagine being in your in your shoes. That was another case from the Appalachian Trail. Thanks for listening, you guys. Uh, Thanks for the reviews. I think we got three more reviews this week. Leave us reviews. Post us on your story. We'll post you on ours if you do. Yeah, follow us on Instagram at Lost in the Woods Podcast. Tell your friends. Like our Facebook page. We would love it. But seriously, you guys, thank you for showing up for us every week. We really appreciate you guys we get a lot of really great 
recommendations. We get a lot of really great feedback. We really, we appreciate the crap out of you guys. I mean, thank you so much for everybody who listens. I mean, we just, we love you guys. So yeah, have a great week, you guys. And we'll be posting some stuff on Instagram and on Facebook. So look for us there and we'll see you soon. Yep. See you next week. Bye guys. By the way, so my Friday morning, guys, I just want to tell you about this really quick. No, Jesus. So we just discovered another another thing that affected Friday morning. So my Friday morning started out okay. I woke up about 6 a.m., which is pretty average normal time for me. Mm-hmm. I go out to the kitchen to make myself coffee and realize that there's no coffee. And I don't know about anybody else, but this is one of the worst things that can happen to me, I think, in life. Especially because I can't just leave to go get coffee, right? I have a sleeping child who I can't leave alone. Older kids aren't home to watch her. So I have no coffee, which in our household, Maddie is responsible for the coffee-related issues. It is her job to bring the coffee home every week. And she... Forgot for multiple weeks because it takes me about three weeks to get through a bag of coffee, but I'm completely out at this point. I haven't brought home coffee in like two months, probably. Yeah. So I have no coffee. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I, I can I can survive this. It's gonna it's gonna be okay. So I grab myself a Starbucks double shot. I have like these little cans that I keep in the fridge sometimes. I grab one. So I'm like, I'll grab my coffee. I'll sit down, I'll watch some news, I'll calm down, everything will be fine. And then, I can't find the TV remote. It's missing. So I'm like, that's weird. I've never not been able to find the TV remote because it has a spot that it goes in every single day, right? So I'm like, maybe Madison, for some weird reason, took it downstairs. Maybe, because our remotes will turn on both TVs, but they'll only work to change channels on the TV they're programmed for. So I'm like, maybe she couldn't find the remote, needed to turn it on, right? So I come downstairs to look for said missing remote. And not only can I not find the remote, but the floor downstairs is sticky. Oh, it was definitely my bad. And not only is the floor sticky, but there is also stuff everywhere. And we live in a very clean house. This stuff wasn't everywhere. We did some cleaning. They did some questionable. We very quiet. coordinated trash into one area. Okay. I don't even want to hear it. So, <laughs> downstairs terrifying. And the, the downstairs is for them. I don't use the downstairs. So, they, have, they can have their friends over. They can do whatever they want downstairs. Just clean up your mess. So, can't find the remote. Search everywhere. Dig through everything. I'm like, well... I guess I'm not watching the news this morning. That's fine. Because if I turn the TV on, cartoons were on. So that's not going to help me, right? So I go back upstairs and I'm like, I'll just go out on the back deck and enjoy my coffee, right? We have a nice, huge backyard. It's very relaxing. I can hear the birds chirping. I get outside and I'm standing there and I'm looking at our chairs around the fire pit. And I notice that they're broken, like, there, it looks like somebody... The bottom of the marble. The, the bottom. It looks like somebody stood on them and jumped on them until the bottom fell through. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that sounds almost exactly like what happened. <laughs> so I'm really confused. And I'm like, now... And I'll, I'll, I may have sent a video to Madison at this point. I'll, uh, I'll maybe post that I'm for sleeping, you guys. I'm sleeping, by the way. I'm in my bed sleeping in the same household just to sleep. But I that, also didn't rip the chairs. That was other people that ripped the chairs. I don't care who did it. You were still Shout out to Brina and John. <laughs> okay, Brina and John. I'd like my <laughs> new lawn chairs by Friday, please. Yeah, so I sent her a video. And then eventually I did wake her up because I'm like, I need the remote. Which I was unresponsive and no help to that. <laughs> so that's basically how my Friday morning went. And then just now I opened the freezer downstairs and realized that all of the ice has melted 
and there's a puddle on the floor and it looks like the freezer kind of exploded and I have no idea what happened, but somehow I know it's connected to Madison. So And the floor is sticky because I, I don't even want to no, I don't even want to hear it. Madison's not even gonna get a chance to defend herself. Anyway, so that's how my Friday went. I will move it to the end, but that is how my Friday morning went. <laughs>